I would say as an outsider, if I were to define Geordie Shaw, someone who's watched it a few times and, you know, a bit of a fan of some of, some of the people that are on that show is lunatics, yeah. but in a funny way, and all massive. They're all like gym people. Yeah. There's obviously been certain people that have suggested that some of the some of, some of the people on there are on steroids. Yeah. Any truth in it? <laughs> has Geordie Shaw been a blessing or has it been a curse? It completely changed my life overnight. Not every single person is going to be Kim Kardashian. I don't understand why other people on TV or reality TV don't buy a business and set it up and make money that way. Unless you've got that right mindset, advisors, friends, mentors around you, again, sometimes people have this great profile, but it just it just goes away. Reality TV is not a career, it's a stepping stone. Reality TV, make sure you use it as a stepping stone. That was a quote from an ex-podcast guest, Mr. Carl Christie. We speak all things Geordie Shaw, his time on a TV program, his businesses, and of course, his new family rival, which is his son. Be happy, never content, make sure you're subscribing, and of course, sharing the episode. Before we start this week's podcast, I have to give a special mention to our sponsors. I Secure Vehicles. They are a brilliant company, a family-run business, and they specialize in vehicle safety and security throughout the UK. I know this company very well, and I also know the people behind the brand. If you've been following me on my podcast journey and on social media, you will know that I love cars and so does my network. This is why I'm very, very excited to be working with iSecure Vehicles, and this is why we have chosen them to be our sponsors for the Stephen Sully Study Podcast. Their team are professionals, experts, and they're efficient. Once a product is installed on your car, your vehicles, you will have the peace of mind that your asset is protected. Trust me, do not wait until it's too late. Get protection now. For more information about their products, including dash cameras, undetected immobilizers, and also car tracking systems, head over to isecure-vehicles.co.uk. And remember to mention the Stephen Sully Study podcast sent you. Right, welcome back to the podcast, Stephen Sully Study. I've got a really cool guest in front of me today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Mr. Cole Christie, welcome on board. Thank you for coming to Mayfair and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Mir. Thank you for having me. Right, first question I want to ask you. I know you came here for the podcast, but you've walked through our Mayfair Gallery, Woodbury House, and saw some of the art on the wall. And also, you have a... You've had a bit of a sales presentation from me about Richard Hamilton. <laughs> what are your um, what are your thoughts and feelings behind the art and also the premises? Well, I'm just scoping it out to be honest, mate. I'm I'm planning on uh, stealing all your art off you. I'm planning on breaking in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean uh, when I walked in, like I'm not that big in art and stuff. But as soon as I walked through the door, I was like, wow. I mean, you see me. I, I was like, oh wow, this is amazing, like incredible. And um, then you chose the price, and I was like, Jesus. <laughs> But no, it's uh, it's beautiful art. It really is. Yeah, I mean, look, there's there's two sides to it. There's the side which is the obvious side, which is adoring it, appreciating it, loving it, you know, consuming it. And then there's the investment side. And I feel that certainly the way the UK has gone with the economy kind of on its knees, cost of living, yep. interest rates, hikes, more and more people are looking for alternative places to put their money in. And art is definitely one of them. And this is actually a good little segue into part one of your businesses, Conway and Christie is yep. a an estate agency. Yep. Um, tell me a bit more about a, a bit more about that brand. Why did you start it, and how have you seen the property market shift during the year of two thousand twenty three? Um, so I first got into it because I was doing a um, one of my business partners was called Stephen Green. He was a he was a big like property guy, loved his property, and had a like portfolio of multi million pound. And I got close to him and he started saying the best place to bank your money that you've made from these TV shows is property. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. So I started working with him very closely and he basically taught me everything he knew about property. And I can't thank him enough for that. But then when we were buying properties, we were doing them up, we were flipping them. We needed somewhere to 
sell our properties that we were getting and I was thinking mm. to myself why is the estate agents why are we cutting them in and them getting so much money and we're not doing that so we got approached by my business partner at the minute Sarah Conway and she was like why don't you come in with me and we'll go halfy half and we'll sell properties together so I can get away to sell my properties through it and hers as well so yeah it's um it's been really good though and I, I don't understand why other people on TV or reality TV don't pursue normal careers like that. Okay, you don't have to go and get a job, but like like get a normal career as in buy a, buy a business and set it up and make money that way. Yeah. The thing is as well, a lot of what you just said there, because I've had a lot of reality TV stars on the podcast. I've yeah. had a lot of footballers on the podcast. I've had a lot of boxers on the podcast. And they all talk about, when I say they, the industry talks about becoming this high profile person, being being good at your craft. But then sometimes the secondary element is you're left to your own devices when it comes down to investing your money. And as you well know, if you don't have the right guidance, if you don't have the right mentors, if you don't have the right trusted advisors, you can either end up spending all your money on Ferraris, yep. fast women, fast cars, and fast yep. lifestyle, or snakes prey on you, and then you end up putting it into the wrong places. And the good thing about the property sector is, look, there's still bad property deals out there, but nine times out of 10, if you invest your money into bricks and mortar, long-term, you're gonna make money. That's exactly what I was gonna say, yeah. Bricks and mortar is always a safe bet. Um, it's the best way to put your money into, and it's just like, I've always found when I'm putting my money into other stuff, it's like I can see a house, I can see what it is, I can see how much it can make and how much it can make me and my family. So I much prefer seeing that rather than putting it into other areas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the biggest billionaires in the world and some Warren of them, you know, they, <laughs> they, 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 a lot of their backbone of their portfolio is in actual fact in property. So mm -hmm. there's a telltale sign there. Can I ask you a question? Why? So you mentioned about flipping property. Yeah. I know that's a really good strategy and there's a lot of big people out there that make a huge amount, amount of money off it. But equally, sometimes when you flip an asset, you lose the asset and all you're left with, with is cash. Why not retain the property and then cash flow? Why didn't you go I, down there? I personally, I only start, when I first started my property journey, that's when I was doing the flipping. I was like, right, come in, do them up, get them out. Now, I do not do that. I like to gain my property portfolio and I like to like keep my properties um, under my belt. The perfect place to do that is like London, like round here. If you get a property round here, do not sell it. Do not sell it. You need to sit on it and you need to rent it out. So um, your property portfolio, does it consist of London as well as Newcastle or where um, else have you got property? I've got a few in Spain. Uh, I've actually got a few in Scotland as well and Newcastle. I did have one in London, but that's been rented out at the minute, but I had it with a, I was JVing with another partner and they've took that off my hands for us because I had just too much on up here and I couldn't be bothered to, it was like I was chasing people around looking for money and I was just like, you take that off my hands and you just owe me that. Um, so yeah, I've got, a, I've got mostly it's Newcastle though, mostly there. Okay. Because I can keep an eye on them. I can like, keep an eye on what's happening with the property and I don't have to like constantly come down. So your your company, does it does it manage the properties as well or do you subcontract that out to another agency? We subcontract that out to another agency. Okay, nice. Yeah. So Scotland, Spain, London, Newcastle, which area has been the best return on investment for you? Spain, 100%, really? yeah. Because Spain's on the, it, it crashed in, I think it was 2008, 2010 it crashed but it's gone up since then. So we bought them all at a low price. Um, this is when I first got on reality TV and it's just gone up and up and up since then. So when you say low cost, what sort of numbers are you talking? Um, I think we got a property for, was it for 230, something like that? 230 and now it's worth like 440 or something. I mean, it is over like a seven year period, something like that, but um, it's still good. And what, what what I like to do with Spain is, I like to rent them out to holiday makers, which is perfect for me, because they're not in for a long term. Mm. They all pay a good amount and they yeah. all just come in for like a week or two. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're off. Although 
the bad side of that is it is out of season. So like, it's hard to get your property rented in January. Yeah. It's hard to get your property rented in February, but all the other times of the year, it's actually all right. Yeah, I mean, the other times of the year when it's really, really hot, I guess then you're, you're charging big premiums for it. So yep. it kind of, it pans out when it's not so good over there. You've already charged that premium, yeah. which is going to cover you for the year. Um, another question then is why, why choose somewhere like Spain? To invest your money? I used to live there. Okay. So I lived there when I was growing up. I lived there for three years. Okay. And um, we already had a property over in Spain. And so we knew how the property market worked. This isn't just me. This is my family as well. Um, they had a few properties there. So yeah, that's, what, that's why I would say we shifted towards there. But there is other places you can go. That's amazing. I've got a, um, a person I JV with and he buys a lot of places in Tuscany. Right. Like little, like, you know, like little farmhouses that are like built down and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does them up and then he rents them out to Americans. And the Americans love Italy. Really? Yeah, they adore it. Really? Anything to do with Italy, anything to do with France, they all jump on it. Yeah. So where, where is your places in uh, Spain? Like Marbella? Um, Marbella, Alicante. We've got a few in Alicante. Um, that's mainly the area that we're in. And it's normally like uh, families. You know, like fa like family holidays. They don't need to be next to bars. They don't need to be next to like party places. And um, they just come over just for the villa. Um, Marbella, we've got a couple of places in Marbella, but it's normally like for stag do's and stuff. Right. I would say that, yeah. So that makes sense about Spain. It also makes sense about Newcastle. London is a given because it's, you know, obviously it's, London, isn't it? it's got its own ecosystem here. Yeah. And it's, it's always thriving. Scotland. Why the hell have you bought a property in Scotland? <laughs> a lot of people like Scotland, you know. Going back to the Americans as well. The Americans love Scotland. I like Scotland. Yeah? Yeah, I like it. Uh, it was, well, it's actually, it's not a few properties. It's only like two properties. We've got them on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Right. So a lot of people like to do the whole Braveheart thing. You know, like okay. come over and pretend they're in that. And that is a lot of... Um, a lot of Americans as well. A lot of my stuff is shifted towards Americans because I do a TV show in America. Right. So I know that a lot of my um, social media, there's a lot of Americans. So I've got to try and like bend towards them and see what they want to do. Okay, understood. Yeah. So by the properties then, what else have you put your your, your, your finances into over the years? Um, over the years, I put it into a number of things. One of the things I always had was I had a great mom who she had power of attorney. So she was like, she ran all my money. So every time I made money, so you get Geordie Shaw, you get people like, would come out with a fortune on one series and we're all young kids and we're all idiots. And we'd have certain lads running off and buying like expensive cars, expensive holidays, all that. And I really wouldn't do that, but I was only 20 years old, 21 years old when I got on Geordie Shaw. I was never able to do that because my mom had power of attorney. And I used to give every single penny I earned to her. So she would control my funds. And back in my early 20s, I was like, oh, that's terrible. I want to buy the fast cars. I want to I want to go on holiday. I want to go here, there and everywhere. But as I got on and I've got older, I've got this money saved up that my mom has basically saved for me. And I just like, I thank her for that. And it's much better because she had a business head on her, whereas I had a young playboy's head on me. So it, it's worked out perfect for me, but I've, uh, I've invested in, I used to do gas and electricity and I had a company there and now I do um, the claim side of it. I do all the claim side of it. And I also um, have invested into property side. So I started flipping properties, stuff like that. But then I got into the estate agents. Nice, Yeah. nice. So look, um, talking about kind of the obvious, your social status, um, you know, you're following, let's say, quote unquote, your fame. Most of it, I would say, has come from the very famous show, Geordie Shaw. Yeah. Um, my question to you is this. Has Geordie Shaw been a blessing or has it been a curse? I would say a blessing. I got in at the right time. And I think a lot of my castmates will say the same thing. Yeah. They, Geordie Shaw was weird because it went on for so long. And I feel like the first few series, the first 10 series, every single cast member that was involved in that has used it for their advantage. And I mean, after that, it died off a lot. So 
all the people that came in after that have just like got normal jobs and normal lives, which is which is great as well. But I would say we got in at the right time. Yeah. And um, we were able to make money off it. Yeah. I had a bit of a long conversation with Tommy Mallet about this. He's yeah. Been, he's been on my podcast. And we spoke off air actually about using you don't have it doesn't have to be reality tv it could be sports it could be reality tv it could be other types of tv where you build up your profile and that's kind of like your your own marketing and then you can pivot that into a product a service a business a system and monetize that and again i feel like unless you've got that right mindset advisors friends mentors around you again sometimes people have this great profile but it just it just goes away. Not every single person is going to be Kim Kardashian. And that is the, like one of the only professional reality stars that doesn't have to do anything else. And she probably still has a lot of other businesses. What you need to do with reality TV, right? You need to build your profile as much as possible, get as much money as possible, save every penny you get. So if you're on Love Island now and you're coming into the series and you're the big hit, you're the big fucking poncho, you're the big like um, person you need to save every single penny you've got. You need to save every bit of fame you've got and just invest it into something else. Reality TV is not a career, it's a stepping stone. That's a good bit of advice. Yeah. Um, can it sometimes feel like reality TV can build you up, chew you up and then spit you back out? Yeah, it did with me. Um, In what way? So I did Geordie Shaw for, I was on it for six seasons, I think. And then me and my ex, who's on the show now, who I'm absolutely sound with now, we're, we're good friends. Uh, MTV had to choose between me and her. Like, who do they want to keep? And she'd been on it since day one. So obviously they were going to pick her. So they chewed me up and spat me out. And I was down. I was so depressed over it. I was just destroyed. And... The weird thing is now, I felt like that, and this was like, God, it's got to be about 2016, I felt like that now. And there is must be so many kids out there who feel like that, who have been on Love Island for five minutes, or they've, they've done one TV show, and it's lifted them up to here, but then it's hard to come back down to normal life. Mm. Um, I was good because I had a good support system around me. I had a good family. I had good friends. And... I got cut from Geordie Shaw, but it got me on another TV show in America called The Challenge. And if I didn't get, they even said this, if I didn't get cut from Geordie Shaw, they wouldn't have considered me for that. So it's like cutting a part of you off to let the self of you grow, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, it was a blessing in disguise. And obviously I, I went and done The Challenge for years and years, and then I came back to Geordie Shaw, and now I do the both of them. Um, and honestly, I was I was so depressed back then. I, I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I feel like there has to be a better support system because there's so many kids that are going to go through that. Yeah. And kids that haven't even gotten TV shows yet, they're going to go through that. And I know it. And I see it. And I watch these TV shows. And I say like, shit, they're not getting much airtime. Or shit, they're not, they're not. I feel sorry for them, you know. I don't know. It, sometimes I feel like it's a good choice to do it. And sometimes I feel it's a bad choice. I feel like when I got into it, me and uh, Aaron, James, all the rest of them, when we got into it, it was the perfect time. Now, the, the market is so saturated that unless you're going to be like a, a Molly May or a Tommy Fury, you're going to be like the head of a TV show, you're not going to get much from it. Yeah, yeah. The um, You said about support system, actually. I was going to talk about this later on, but... Jack Fincham was on my podcast and obviously yeah. he won Love Island. And yeah. he said the big difference between a reality TV show such as Made in Chelsea or Geordie Shore, etc., et it's kind of like you, you slowly build yourself. But with something like a Love Island, it's so concentrated and you go in there, basically a normal person, you come out weeks later, whatever it is, and suddenly he came out with like two, three million followers and it was quite overwhelming. Yeah. And there's been a lot of people that unfortunately have done self-harm and actually taken their own lives off the back end of some of these things. Yeah. Do you feel like, I don't know, is, is it the TV programs that are the problem or is it the support that sometimes isn't there? That's why some people go off and do drugs, drink, or maybe a bit of self-harm. I would say the, the support system back then 
when we were all in it was was wasn't good it was terrible but now they you want to see it now when you do these tv shows now it's like if you do like uh, any of my shows or any of these Love Island shows, you have people next to you all the time now going, are you okay? Are you all right? How did that, how did that go, that conversation? Do you feel all right? They have a team of people who are literally employed to follow me around and ask if I'm okay. And I start like thinking to myself, am I okay? Am I all right? <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ, should I have reacted different there? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's mad, mate. And I do feel for the Love Island people because with Geordie Shaw made in Chelsea and all the rest of it, we like, we like, yeah, graduated. We like had season after season. So we're like, okay, we didn't get it right that season. We're going to do it next season. It'll be all right. Whereas Love Island, it's like shoots you into the stars and then just doesn't worry about your falling. Yeah. Um, Geordie Shaw is a reality TV program. Yeah. How much of it is reality? Um, I would say a lot now because... So Jordy Shaw back in the day, right? It used to be like, right, he's just slept with your boyfriend or he's just slept with your girlfriend. Go and fight each other. I can't believe they've done that. Now, because of we did the reunion show and we're all like old people, um, we're all like, oh my God, because we've got the kids on it as well. The kids got a rash. What do we do about that? And we're all like sitting in the house worrying about this kid's rash who like is not even our kid. <laughs> it's, it's like completely <laughs> developed into that. We don't like fight anymore. We we just worry about each other's kids and like backs and muscles and shit. Yeah, like, yeah. I remember standing up on a night out when I was over doing the last Geordie show, and I was standing next to my mate James. Um, has he done this podcast before, James? Tim? No, well, has he not? I thought he did. And I was standing next to him. You're gonna hook like, me up, now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember standing next to him. I was like, oh, I've got a bad back. They put it on the camera. <laughs> they put it on the camera that I had a bad back. <laughs> like, like it was interesting or something. It, no one gives a shit. Well, do, do some of the, the rows and some of the altercations and some of the disputes that you have on camera, is that a genuine thing? Like if you were off camera, would that argument still carry on? Back in the day, I'd say no. But now I'd say yeah, because the arguments are about real things. Um... I had an argument with one girl in Geordie Shaw because she uh, smashed a mirror and obviously I had my kid in the house because all the families come together and we're all like hanging around with each other and I had a dispute about her. I was like, why the fuck did you do that when I've got my kid in the house? So it was a bit like, that's that's the area I'm in because I've got to protect my family. Mm. Um, and that was a real dispute. But I think it has to be now because we're not actors, we're not actresses. Mm. But back in the day, because everyone was so desperate to stay on the show, everyone made a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. Everyone was like, oh God, yeah, the producers want me to be angry about that, so I'm going to be angry about that. Take me back then to when you first started on uh, Geordie Shore. Um, Aaron's given me his, you know, what he was up to before he started, and then he explained how his life changed. What was it you were doing before Geordie Shore? How did you get into Geordie Shore? And then how did your life develop after Geordie Shore? Um, so before I was doing Geordie Shaw, I was working in a nightclub. I was uh, working on the doors. I was much bigger back then. Um, I wasn't this size now. But Mate, you're a unit. Anyway, <laughs> <now>. <laughs> Mate, I couldn't even wipe my ass back in the day. <laughs> how, how much you weigh now? Like you must be at hundred 14, kilograms, fourteen, fifteen stone, uh, fifteen stone. F I think like three or four, or something like that. But back in the day, I was when I first got on Geordie Shaw. I was about. 17 stone something like that wow. sitting what you six foot two yeah six yeah. two six three yeah, i i was i was i was a unit back then i just wanted to get bigger and bigger and bigger and um back in the day when i was doing geordie shaw when i first got on it i was working on the doors and i started flirting with one of the producers and i didn't know it was a producer at the time and she asked us to go out for coffee and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go out for coffee. That, that sounds good to me. And I turned up the next day for the coffee thinking, oh, my God, I'm in for a ride here. This is going to be class. And it turned out she was a producer and I had four MTV shirts on. And then like 48 hours later, I was in the house. <laughs> it was mental. Um, amazing. Yeah. So clearly your, your following didn't go from zero or let's call it whatever it was to 1.2 million on Instagram yeah. just overnight. But it must have happened pretty rapidly. What... What was that like going from probably a modest, you know, following to absolutely a lion's share of so, the population? I remember 
and I got into the same season as Aaron as well. So we were like, I think we hit the sweet spot of social media because Instagram had come out a year before we got on the show. And I could see when the episodes were on, our following just going boom, 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 up and up and up. It was crazy. And um, yeah, it grew off. It was only off for like three seasons it got to that point of being that level. And it's the same for Love Island as well, isn't it? Because they theirs grows quite quick. Yeah, it was insane. It completely changed my life overnight. Um, being recognised and everything, you never you never really get used to that. Yeah. The people noticing who you are. Yeah. Guys, I wanted to hop on here to once again thank the sponsors of this week's podcast, I Secure Vehicles. When we were searching around for sponsors for the channel, we honestly wanted to get a brand, a company that would give massive amount of value to our audience. And that is definitely iSecure Vehicles. They have a wide range of products which are designed to keep your vehicle, your asset safe and secure. Some of those products are dash cameras, undetected immobilizers, and car tracking systems. Head over to iSecure to look at their products and make sure you say that the Stephen Sully Study podcast sent you there. I mean, look, you, you come across someone who's got your head switched on. You se- it seems like, you know, you're very, very grounded and you also seem very, very headstrong as well. And I guess you have to be when you've got multiple businesses and a lot of things going on. But some people, if they had over a million followers, I know, I actually do know certain people that got big following and they take it very personally when they get the slander, the hate, the ridicules, the people trolling, trolling yeah. them and, and stuff. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with hate comments online? So, for the first year or two, I cared all about that. If someone put a bad comment on, if someone tried to slate us down, I would take it to heart and I would do everything I could to fix that comment, to be like, well, they said they said I had a big nose, get a nose job. If they said uh, I had shit hair, go and get it, like, hair transplant and stuff like that and that, all this different that, stuff that one last night it said, said, said something didn't it aye, you, aye, yeah, aye. Yeah. do you know what it is he picked the only thing on my body that I'm not self conscious about <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to do we're going to get that up here you can just put the little print screen yeah. on what he said he said my eyebrows were shit and I think my eyebrows are fine <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah like so for the first two years of being on the show you got to think I was 21, 22 everything I took to heart and I was like, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to make sure that's okay. You cannot put everything, effort in uh, making everyone happy because they're just going to pick something else. Mm. If it's not your hair, it's your nose. If it's not your nose, it's your eyebrows. If it's mm. not your eyebrows, it's your, I don't know, your stomach or something. They're just going to keep picking at you. No one's perfect. Mm. And I think I got to a point of being griefed so much that I thought to myself, the only people I care about their views is my family yeah, and the people I respect and the people I like. So say we're friends and you've got a negative view about us, that will affect me. But if you're some random prick in the street, I'm not bothered. I don't give a shit. That was going to be my next question, actually. Like reality versus social media. It's very easy to become a keyboard warrior and sit in your room in the safety of your own home commenting slandering people because you know nothing physical is going to come back but in the streets has anyone ever come over to you and actually ever been rude to you it is normally if a girl if a girl asks me for a photo it is nine times out of ten the person i'll have shit with is their boyfriend and they'll just keep saying stuff and keep saying stuff what now, in, I've in got, front I've of got, you i've got oh yeah really yeah it's on a night out and we're all drunk right you know what i mean and they just keep poking 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 they're just waiting for you to react yeah and um, have you ever got to that moment almost maybe <laughs> <laughs> no comment <laughs> no comment yeah but it's it is hard but i think i've grown up a lot since then and you don't get it as much now you don't get as much hate or slander and that because people know that you can just get punched in the face especially yeah. in front of people yeah well, so made in chelsea Towie. Geordie Shaw, all very, very popular shows and all all got their pluses. I would say as an outsider, if I were to define Geordie Shaw, someone who's watched it a few times and, you know, bit of a fan of some of of the people that are on that show is 
lunatics, yeah. but in a funny way, and all massive. They're all like gym people. Yeah. There's obviously been certain people that have ridiculed or suggested that some of the some of the people on there are on steroids. Yeah. Any truth in it? <laughs> I know, I know, I know this guy. I know this guy here called Corey Wharton. He was oh, caught up. I knew he called. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear what he said? Yeah, he, yeah. he, he was trying did, to. Did call you have him on or not? No, I never. Oh, did you on. not? I thought no, you had no, him no. on there. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> Corey's my friend as well, you know. Yeah. Oh, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said that because obviously we've got a lot of past. We've got a lot of. When I was first on Geordie Shaw, you just want to get bigger, you want to get stronger, you want to get better. And a lot of us um, did partake in a lot of that, you know, like not even steroids to the sense of like we used to have anything to get bigger, you know. Um, so eating a lot, training a lot, you know, obviously all the right proteins, yeah. etc. But when I got when I graduated to the challenge and I had to go on there, I lost a lot of weight because I just couldn't be maintaining it exactly yeah, yeah. And, it, and with that show it's a lot of running so you see these lads who are roided out the heads who come in to the show and they're running up mountains it just doesn't cope it, they're swimming um, and I think a lot of us learned that quick that you couldn't be that size anymore mm. plus it's not manageable yeah it's yeah. rubbish yeah, oh, I saw he made this comment of you, and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it, even though I feel a little bit uncomfortable asking the question. I just wanted to see your take on it, but I didn't know that Corey was actually a friend of yours. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. We, even still today. Uh, yeah, 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 really. yeah. Oh, yeah. So we do the same show. We do uh, the challenge together, and uh, yeah, it's still, we've had we've had a bit of run-ins a few times. Try to kill each other a few times. <laughs> right. So. Um, some of the real, real positive things in your life right now is definitely going to be your family. Uh, crew Jack, uh, Jax, who yep. is your son, um, and obviously you're now engaged to your fiance, yep. Vicky Turner. Mm -hmm. How has your life kind of turned since you've become a father? Um, I would say massively because I think before you're a father, you just care about yourself. And I'm sorry to Vicky, but you cared about myself <laughs> constantly. And when you have a kid now it's all about them and i know it's cliche everyone says that oh you put the kid first but you really do like your their happiness matters more than yours so constantly now i'm thinking right as long as he's happy i can be happy as long as he's okay i can be okay his feelings come before mine hmm. and I, I think it's probably going to be like that for the rest of my natural life hmm. you got um you got engaged abroad yep did I, am i right in saying that it was on a yacht <laughs> yeah yeah um was this all kind of planned or was it off the cuff no i i, I planned it for a while uh, i knew obviously i'd have the kid with her and we'd been together uh, five years five years when i proposed so she kind of like deserved it. And I did want to do it, but I didn't want to do it while she was pregnant. Uh, that was a big thing for me. I said to her, I was like, I will not propose to you while you're pregnant. And a lot of people try to pressurize me into that. I was like, I'm not doing it. And why? Because I didn't want it to be like a shotgun wedding. Okay. You know, when uh, like old fashioned, you know, when the dads come behind her and they're like, you've got to marry me daughter. Um, I wanted it, I wanted to propose to her because I wanted to and not just because she was pregnant. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I wanted her to feel special. I didn't want to have a big belly when I was when I was proposing that. Yeah, it was almost, it, I know what you mean. Like it can seem like- You're only the, doing this because she's pregnant. The big reason why you're doing it is you're, you're kind of half forcing yourself into doing exactly. it because, because she's pregnant. Exactly, so I wanted it to be special. I wanted it to be perfect for her. Um, and that's really, I want, plus I want to enjoy life. And you mm. know, like, getting engaged and pregnant all within the same time period and we got a dog a few months before this so that as well i wanted it to be like enjoy my life so like get engaged have a kid get a dog except like i did it reverse <laughs> Um, so Vicky Turner is obviously a, a model, very, very good looking lady. And it yep. seems like you two are getting on like a house on fire. And oh, it looks like you're going to have some, some many great years ahead of you. And obviously your son, very, very, very cute. 
Was it love at first sight when you met Vicky Turner? Oh yeah, it was. I'm terrified you're going to tell us tell us something about where I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like you've got something written yeah. that I know about. Well, Vicky Turner was dating <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. In. I was like, fucking hell, <laughs> made me hot. <laughs> um, plan for any more children? Uh, yeah, mate. Yeah, uh, not for a while. I think when you have a kid, right, you think to yourself oh yeah, we'll have another one, it'll be class. And then you get a bit down the line and you're like, yeah, we'll do it another year. We'll give it another year. We'll give it another year. I think a four year gap will be good for us. Um, plus I want to get married first. I, I really want to get married first. But she doesn't want two kids at the wedding and I, I have no idea why. Having two kids at the wedding is exactly the same as having one. Yeah, are you going to get married over here or abroad? Abroad. Whereabouts? We've been looking today, actually, when I was coming down on the train, looking at Italy, uh, looking at Portugal. There's a few places. I want to get married abroad because um, my brother's getting married in the UK and my cousin's getting married in the UK and they're getting married a year before us. So I just want to do something abroad. I want to do like a... F I'm quite selfish, me, you know. I want, I want to do like a family holiday and I want my family to come on holiday with us. But every time I invite my family to go on holiday with us, none of them want to come. So if I get married abroad, they have to come. And then when they get over there, I'll just be like, yeah, hey, the marriage isn't the big part. It's more like we're going to fucking have a session together. So well, I, I got uh, married abroad in Ibiza in 2020. And I got married at a restaurant. I'll, I'll send you over if you haven't heard of it. It's called Amanti. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Amanti means lover in yeah, yeah. in in, uh, in 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 one Spain. Of, one, yeah. of, one of the so I'm do I'm filming it on Geordie Shore because we're doing a new season called Geordie Shore: The Reunion, and uh, I'm filming it on there. So in Amanti or Ibiza? Um, oh, well, no, just just on okay. the show. Okay. But there was a there was another girl on the show, um, my ex, and she got married in Ibiza. Not sure if it was the same place, but it was beautiful where they got married. And uh, Jory Shaw filmed it there, so I didn't nice. think there'd be game to film the same place twice. Yeah, yeah. I said to um, my ex, I was like, it's, it's perfect, that place. I might get married there as well. <laughs> so, do you know, like, obviously, clearly, you keep yourself in really, really good nick. Yeah. yeah? Training. Um, so, how much, your success, how much of it comes down to your day-to-day -day routine, training, and looking after yourself? I would say it took me a long time because when I used to, when I first started training, I just wanted to get bigger and stronger because I was 18 when I first started training and Geordie Shaw was already a big thing. And I seen the lads on Geordie Shaw, I seen um, Jay and stuff like that, and uh, a lad called James. And they were big lads, and I was like, oh, I want to do that show. I, I want to get bigger, I want to get stronger, I want to be as big as them. So my training when I first started was about getting bigger, eating more doing whatever, trying to get as big as possible. But then it took me a long time to correlate the system of, wow, if I exercise, it makes my mental health much better. And it didn't understand that until my mid twenties. I was like, oh shit, if I exercise, that's the, that's the steady basis for a good life. So you go to the gym, you exercise, you, 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 you feel good about yourself and that'll improve every single aspect of your life. Mm. I, I do honestly believe that it's a natural good good drug, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. If, if it you're is. Releasing, releasing them endorphins and taking away the pressure, the stresses of day to day work or day to day life by doing boxing, gym, weights, running, whatever yeah. it is. You probably feel the same way about boxing, didn't you? Definitely. When definitely. you get out of a boxing gym, you feel incredible. My my best session of the week is usually a Friday because that's where we do open sparring. So you normally go down the boxing gym. Get to gym someone's head in. And you do not know <laughs> who you're going to be sparring. And the funny thing is, you get a really good endorphin rush when you actually spar and you have a really good sparring session. But in a weird way, getting a bit of a bashing sometimes actually makes you really alert and awake during the day because you're like you, i don't know i say it's that kind of fight or flight mode that something inside of you has now been awakened because you've had a couple of digs to your face yeah, every, such, every day you wake up she's just get your wife to fucking bray you before you come in she does that anyway <laughs> <laughs> and that's when i found out that it was really good for us <laughs> So um, the type of training you're doing right now then, is it, yep. is it purely weights? So are you going for running, I, sprints, any kind of sport? I used to have to do weights, weights constantly. That was for Geordie Shaw. But when I moved over to America and did the challenge, that's when I had to like 
fucking hell, I can't run. And like, I couldn't run more than a mile. Now I'm a really good runner. I cycle a lot, um, swim a lot. And it has to be like an all round basis of it. You know, I do a lot of CrossFit. Okay. Um, and I love, I love me CrossFit. I adore it. And I just basically live like that. Yeah. Do, do you know, like not necessarily Geordie Shaw, but clearly a little bit of a little bit of that. Obviously, I've had Aaron Charm as a good friend of mine on yeah, the yeah. podcast, and he, he shared some of the experiences back in the day with the drink. There was obviously drugs and yeah, yeah. going out, partying, etc. And obviously, when you build up a massive profile as well, you, you must be invited to these clubs and these restaurants and dinners all the time, where part of all that is going to be, you know, the drinks and everything else. Was there ever a moment where you could see yourself or maybe even just some of your peer group getting pulled into that world? and Get, Getting wrapped up on nights out and a lot of uh, people from the show haven't cured this yet and they're still involved in them nights out, but you can't be going out like four or five nights a week and expect your mental health to be okay. I did it when I was younger and in my early 20s, but now I think honestly four nights out a week would destroy me. I mean, are you not the same? Or you'd be the same, wouldn't you? Like, definitely. definitely. <laughs> I had a relatively uh, late night last week on Wednesday, I think it was. It wasn't super, super late, but a little bit. Still feeling like shit now. Tired. <laughs> like, it, was, it, was only, it was only up until last night I, I managed to get and, and do a road run. But yeah. It takes me so long to recover. And yeah. I just feel so kind of, um, what's the word? I just don't feel on point. Yeah. I just don't feel on point. What's the age difference between me and you then? I'm, I'm 31. What? I'm 37. You're 37, are you? Yeah, I'm you're 37. You're good for your age, by the way. Thank you, mate. I thought you were about the same age as me. I thought yeah. you were 30, 31. But um, yeah, you, it, it, it does. It yeah. does. It, it knocks you for ages. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you as well, because being on a reality TV show, having a big profile, like mental health every so often catches up with the best of us. Is there, were, there, were there any sort of depressing dark moments in your life and how did you come out of that? Yeah, um, I would say when I first lost my first TV show, when I stopped doing Geordie's show, I was mentally, I was fucked. I was fucked for a long time. And I bet this is what a lot of people feel like when they come down from reality TV shows, when they've been on the Love Island for one season, they've been on the Essex or they're made in Chelsea for one season or whatever. And I, it was a massive come down for me. And I had to realize what was more important in my life. It's not a camera in front of your face or people telling you the, the best thing in the world. It's your family, it's your friends, it's how you feel with them, you know, rather than some random teenager in your face telling you the best thing since sliced bread. Mm. It's not about that life, you know, mm. because at the end of the day, it's more about what your family think. Yeah. And it's like, even like, I always say this, my best therapy sessions, right? So I got sent to therapy by a TV show and they were to help me. I got more therapy of having a pint with my family or my friends than all of these massive therapy sessions. So-called experts, yeah. Yeah, yeah so-called yeah. experts, yeah. I got, yeah. More, I got more out of a pint with my friends than having therapist in my face and is that because it was more of a relaxed kind of unofficial environment and they were people that you trusted it's because they care about you yeah. you know it's because you know that they your how you feel affects them and i don't think you get that from therapists so so the kind of advice or kind of voicing experience is Look, therapists do obviously clearly serve a part to the community yeah, and, and probably some people get a lot of really good stuff from it. But at least what you can do, which is free, voicing your concerns, voicing your problems and sharing some of your troubles because half problem half shared, half shared is, is problem halved. Yeah, 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 definitely. And I, um, I also think for people who are going to get on reality TV, the, like these Love Islands, all the rest of them, I think what I did was what I did was the problem where I went all in and was like this is the best thing since sliced bread nothing else matters just being on this TV show that's the only thing that matters I think what people need to do now they need to keep a level head mm -hmm. and they need to think to themselves like life is bigger than that camera in my face and there's more to life than that and I think you need to look at an end goal rather mm -hmm. than being the most famous person on the planet look at like, what can I get out of this? Not what they can get out of you. Yeah. 
as you said at the start, using it as a stepping stone. It is. That's what it is. Aaron's a good friend of mine. I met him down boxing booth, yep. Jim. I've actually done a few rounds with him sparring and, you know, I've really got a lot of time from him. In actual fact, I think he's going to come back onto the podcast mm-hmm. when he's down London next. He has pivoted his profile into the fighting game. Yeah. And you can see with the likes of KSI, Jake Paul, Logan Paul, many others, Deji, you know, they, they, they're clearly... They're clearly, clearly cleaning up financially, pivoting in, into the fight world. Now, obviously, there's a lot of people criticising it, saying, oh, it's not good for boxing or they're not, not real fighters, etc." What is your own view about reality TV stars or even YouTubers going into the fight world? Um, I think you shouldn't blame the reality stars or the, the, the stars like Logan Paul, uh, what uh, Jake, yes, Paul, yeah. Jake Paul sorry Jake Paul KSI all the rest of them you should if you don't blame them blame the people that are watching it because they're pulling the numbers in mm. they're getting all of the numbers they're getting all of the views The so it's people that are interested in it yeah. you know okay they might not be the best fighters of all time they might not be the Muhammad Ali's or the Mike Tyson's but you're watching them just as much yeah so you know what I mean yeah it was impressive to see that Aaron worked to himself into a position where he fought the best ever, which was yeah. Floyd, Floyd yeah. Mayweather. When you saw him, and granted, it was an exhibition match in, in, in London, Aaron Chalmers against Floyd Mayweather, what was that like, being uh, a friend of his yeah. and also a former reality TV kind of personality alongside Aaron? Yeah, it was amazing. It was incredible. And it was like, it was, I'm going to sound really selfish, yeah, but it wasn't just amazing for him, it was amazing for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> like people were coming up to us and asking us questions about it and that was like yeah yeah we'll be fighting him yeah we're, we're all we're all gonna be there don't worry about it <laughs> so that's my natural next question i mean you keep yourself in good nick you're yeah. actually a, a bit of a lump yourself would you ever go into a boxing fight if you got, um, got paid the right money if i got paid the right money then yeah i would definitely do it but i've got to pay the right money see aaron aaron worked the system well he like he went in and he fought proper fighters. He built himself up. I'm too fucking lazy, me. I just want the big fight now. <laughs> <laughs> what would be the right money for you to do a boxing fight? What do I think? <laughs> I'm talking to my brother there, by the way, my agent. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know, mate. I really don't. Million quid? Yeah. I would do that in a second. hundred grand? I would I would tie both my hands around me back and then let you fill us in. That much money. <laughs> Um, so I know off air we spoke about your ambitions your goal to move over to America yeah when's that going to happen whereabouts in America and why America there's just more opportunity there my businesses can thrive there at the minute I'm stuck in this like UK market where we want to expand to America I mean there's a lot more people there and plus I want me kids to grow up in the sunshine I want my kids to grow up playing sports constantly i want them to be outside so i think i'm looking at florida i'm also looking at california and it's easy for me to do my american tv stuff like the challenge and stuff if i'm over there i get more gigs i get much more gigs over in america than i do the uk now and it's just a better it's a better upbringing for my for my kids and my family and i'm dying to go over there i'm dying to be over there so so is i'm trying to I mean, it's phenomenal that you've got a um, good audience over in America, but I'm trying to work out, in my own mind, is that because Geordie Shaw became very well-known in America or has your, just your own personal profile just own, kind of resonated Own resonate personal with profile. So I got on this show called The Challenge over there, which is the MTV show. Yeah. And it's a bit like um, SAS Who Dares Wins. Yeah. And I had to lose Geordie Shaw before getting that. And when I got hold of that, I had to stick with it and I did. I've done more seasons on the Challenge MTV than I have Geordie Shaw. Mm-hmm. So I would say that is my main source of income and that's mm-hmm. my that's my main area I'm in yeah. um, rather than Geordie Shaw. And I feel like I set myself apart from everyone else in Geordie Shaw by doing that. Yeah. And I mean, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the country though. I love America. I adore the place. So your fiance Vicky is totally happy about going over there. She's fine. Her brother lives there. Really? Yep. Nice. I've got it like rehearsed in my head of like the the discussions we've had. Got like logged down. Yeah, her brother's American. Um, he lives in Kansas City. 
So she's more than happy to go over there. Half her family's over there. Okay. So okay. she's good with it, yeah. And I think she's the same as me, where she wants the kids to grow up in sunshine. I want them to, the American dream, you know? So Crew Jax, in a few years' time, let's just say he's been living over in America for X amount of years, got friends over there, go to school over there, develops an American accent. How um, are you going to feel about your I kid having an American accent? I don't know, you know, because Vicky's brother is from Yorkshire. That's where they're from. And he's moved over there and you, you want to hear his accent. It's the most ridiculous thing ever. <laughs> well, it's like the Beckhams. When they moved over there, all of, the, all of their kids now have an American accent. It's a bit weird to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I, I, I would... It's got to be better than a Geordie accent, hasn't it? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so when are we talking about you moving over to America? Um, I think the next few years, I've just got to let me businesses grow over here. I want to be over there before he starts school. That's a big thing for me because um, I'm still best friends with the people I went to nursery school with. Okay. So I want him to be settled by the time he gets into nursery school. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And what are you doing right now? Like what, what is your main focus here today? Like what you really um, are you up to? I'd, well, I mean, it's the property stuff, um, my investment stuff, but it's also like I do a lot of um, claims as well. And that is a huge business at the minute and it's just taken off. We're saving a lot of people a lot of money and we're going into companies and when they've been missold gas and electricity, we've been claiming that and and getting them court cases and making them a lot of money. Yeah, doing really well out of yeah. that. I mean, we did, we did it with our friends at first and then I realized I was saving my friends like 120 grand in that on the business and I was like, Jesus Christ, I could do this as a business. <laughs> um. I only want to ask you one or two, or two more things. Um, I'm always quite curious, curious to, to, to know. You've got massive followings on, on Instagram and across all your social media. Yeah. There's, there's going to be millions and millions and millions of people follow you. Now, we spoke about trials and haters and stuff, and that's part to one side. But what about people that approach you for business opportunities like brand endorsement deals or advertisements or shout outs? How do you ascertain the real good business opportunities that are going to help your own personal brand or ones that can potentially hinder you? It's, you've got to look at it and you've got to do your homework on it. Um, because back in the day when I first started reality TV, I would have took anything. Now, I'm not like that at all. I've got to take the right thing. I've got to look at it. I've got to look at the company and I've got to make sure not only is it making me money, but it's making everyone else money as well. Um, Cause I've got a lot of friends who will invest. Say like I promote a business. I want to be emotionally and money-wise invested in that business. I'll never just do stuff for like one-offs, you know, like, oh, there's a couple hundred quid do this or a couple of grand do this. I would never do that. I want to be involved with the business if I'm promoting it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Look, I really enjoyed this conversation, mate, and I really thank you for your time and also your brother over there. I've got one more question. I came up with my own mantra, my own kind of quote, when I started my first company when I was younger, 24 years of age. Yeah. It was a sales company. And the mantra was there to keep the salespeople in check and keep them pushing on. And it goes like this, be happy, never content. Now I've got my own interpretation of what that means, but if I were to ask you, Carl, what does be happy, never content mean to you? Always concentrate on your happiness. That's the most important thing but never settle, always strive for more. Perfect, perfect description. Is that good or not? Yeah, <laughs> like it. Thank you very much for your Thank time, you bro. Much, I Thanks really appreciate it. On. Yeah, no worries, mate. Uh, be happy, never content, and make sure you're subscribing. Thank you very much once again, Cole. Guys, before we end this episode, I have to give one more mention to this week's sponsors, iSecure Vehicles. Now, I've already mentioned their products. They are the very best in what they do. They have a wide range of different services and different systems to protect your asset and your vehicle. Head over to their website to find out a bit more. Thanks for watching this week's episode. There's gonna be some more exciting guests, some big names, and some really, really juicy episodes.